So I'll get us close to started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you all. So happy to be here. Um, yeah. This book is, it's given me a good run for my money because especially these chapters right now, it's just so dense with the core teachings, like just so last week we were talking about the aggregates, you know, no big deal, just a huge part of Buddhism. Um, and then this week, literally the next page, it's like, cool, dependent origination. All right. Um, so it's, uh, I'm really appreciating the opportunity to, again, kind of discover it as Buddha discovers it. So we're following his life history and he is starting to find ways to transmit what he discovered under the Bodhi tree. And Dependent co-arising or dependent origination translated both ways. It's so fundamental to his waking up. So you might remember that when he's sitting there under the Bodhi tree, one of the things that Thich Nhat Hanh pulls out in his description is this deep looking into one single leaf and recognizing all of the factors that contribute to that leaf and that each one of them is needed for that leaf to be present. The leaf is not one thing. The leaf is the clouds and the water and the soil and then the seed, right? It's um, all of these factors together. And what I think is so beautiful about as he starts to teach dependent co-arising is it can be a concept, right? Which, you know, the leaf, right? Oh, that makes sense. The leaf needs a lot of things. It's not just one thing. <clears throat> but for dependent co-arising to be applied to suffering, which is truly its potential to help us feel more free on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to directly experience it. It can't be a concept. And that's where meditation comes in. So I tonight would like us to do a little bit of discussion before we meditate, um, because I think it's so important that these, we, you know, kind of wrangle with these concepts a little bit, and then we try them on, we practice them. I, I mean, mindfulness of feelings is an enjoyable practice, I, I think, I, I hope some of you agree, you know, like paying attention to what feels pleasant and unpleasant, and neutral, it's like, oh, I have something to do, this is great, compared to mindfulness of breathing, where you're like, oh my God, so hard, right? One thing, you know, there's a little bit more, but at least for me, even in um, reading for this week and preparing for this week, seeing that practice as like a direct recognition of dependent co-arising, it changes it. Like it's a different practice. It has such a different depth and, and sense to it. Um, yeah, and so I think one interesting way to think about it, it's like, it's always good when you have a, a day full of juicy emotions, because then that's um, a good way to start with your practice. So I think today, um, who here today felt frustrated by anything for any reason at any time? <laughs> nice work, everybody. <laughs> way to get out there. Um, and I think it's I think it's really interesting. I I had a, a like a cute moment of frustration, and it was great because I was on a web call, so I actually could see my face get all like. Argh. I was like, this is just like really unpleasant. Like inside, it's unpleasant. Outside, it's unpleasant all around. Right. Um, my joke in the early pandemic when everything was online was you can't mute your face. You know, like people. Anyway, we show a lot through it. And what I noticed, not, I, I wish it was like in the beginning of this frustration episode, um, but what I noticed pretty quickly was how fixed my experience was. Like I was right and this person was wrong. And actually they wronged me. Like it wasn't just wrong, right? It was like a wronging of me. Um, and that, that story was just like, it's so solid. And it, it was, you know, then I had like a little moment of awareness, thank God, um, probably seeing my face, actually, it's kind of a good intervention to like see yourself um, reacting. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to just be honest, I hope no one from my work is listening, but this happened, this is a terrible habit, but I think a lot of us do it in this day and age where I was actually on a call, 
but I was, you know, reading an email from like, I was doing another thing. So I wasn't even frustrated by what was happening on the call. I was frustrated by my multitasking. So the layers are really deep. Not, none of them are good layers. Um, and so I also was like, wow, if someone on the call is watching my face, they think I'm so pissed right now about what's being talked about, which I don't actually know because I'm not paying attention, obviously, because I'm reading this email. Um, and so it was so interesting kind of coming into awareness of like, oh my God, I'm frustrated. And oh my God, there's this really thick story about what I'm frustrated about. And, you know, it just like, it, it blossomed so quickly. And I think part of the practice of bringing the dependent co-arising to our suffering is owning our part of it, you know? And I was able for myself to recognize like part of the reason I'm frustrated is because I'm multitasking. I'm not reading clearly what's being written, you know? So I'm like, I'm, I'm like over identity and like projecting into it. And part of the problem with this email was a lack of clarity in the beginning that wasn't just this person. It was also me. So much less satisfying than them being wrong, right? But also so much more freedom than this person being wrong and me being right and carrying the burden of that and, you know, whatever I then need to do because I'm so right and they're so wrong. So it's just an interesting moment of seeing that. And I think in a practice like mindfulness of feelings, we get to notice. And as we pay attention to the natural shifts and changes in the sensations in our body, we get to notice how something, you know, some sensory experience arises and we make it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. But actually, it's just a sensation. But it happens so quickly, it's almost imperceptible that we have a role in what's making this experience happen. And knowing that, but actually like knowing that, not like thinking about that, knowing that is just unbelievable training ground. So I think I'm, I'd be curious, anyone um, willing to share a frustration that they think maybe they had some part in today? Like, can you pull it apart? See, there's more than just me and this other person being wrong. Like there's all these causes and conditions, right? So a lot of could, um, dependent arising is really like recognizing the multiplicity of conditions and causes, not just one. Does that resonate for anyone in their frustration from today? Yeah. Yeah. I can share. Um, Do you mind using the mic for our friends at home? Oh, right. Thank you. Hi, friends. <laughs> um, I'm Kelly, and um, what uh, frustrated me today that I noticed I got very um, uh, that reflex mechanism engaged of defensiveness, and it was an email that came in saying, "Did you do this, 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 and this?" And um, I was like, "Yeah, I did do this, this, this." And, this. and, and anyway. Um, so yeah, I was frustrated and then I responded and I, and I realized that what this person said, um, I think where I went, where I was triggered, if you would, um, is I went to like suspicion, right. That it was being like suspicion and, um, and then I also slash a little paranoia, hmm. like, mm, I can't trust this person, so I better BCC myself on everything. <laughs> that's, that's that's where my mind went. Yeah, yeah, and it was just an email, and sometimes things in email land Very, differently, yeah. you know. Yeah. Then if you just pick up the phone and you're like, "Hey, you talk to somebody like they're your best friend." Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I noticed, and yeah. then uh, yeah, where my paranoia goes, and then I got another response from them, and they stated like, uh, "Yeah, I'm not quite sure how." everything landed quite this way and anyhow um yeah and i think that uh, what they had what they intended and and there was an intention they had and there was a different impact on me yeah and the part that i have to bring to it is my interpretation yeah of those words and yeah. the tone and the intention and where my mind un 
check mind, unbridled mind will run with it. Yeah. Which was the suspicion and paranoia. Yeah. Like, ooh, I'm being like um checked in on uh, right. uh, being uh, micromanaged and yeah. being whatever. Yeah. Right. And that, you know, is like you're creating this in some ways like false version of this other person or being. Right? Absolutely. And I even like false adversity. Right. Where there is none, which is, and then I just get to see how through, through an exchange like that, how that can lead to separation. Right. Which is all based on fiction. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. And amazing. You could see it. Right. And I think it's, you know, um, as many folks know here, I love thinking about emotion. And um, when we look, especially at the factors that keep us from being free, our afflictions or our afflictive emotions are certainly one. Um, and our inability to see dependent co-arising and our sense of really getting like fixed. Um, it's, it's really interesting because the emotions, you know, just kind of by design, they do come up with this projection and this perception, right? They come fully loaded with our, you know, ongoing, you know, script past history of what matters in our life. And they're always searching for <clears throat> kind of matching patterns in our everyday. So that beautiful quote by Sukhni Rinpoche of, is this real and true, or is this real but not true? So your experience was real, like, who's checking up on me, right? That was real, but it wasn't true to this moment. And so it's really hard for us to kind of recognize our role in it. And again, it's, it's just... Um, it's in some ways like it's like less satisfying in the short term. It's so much easier to have that <clears throat> concrete, that person's wrong. They're doing something wrong. I was wrong. The complexity is tougher, but there's so much more freedom. Can I respond? Please. Yeah. Hi, friends. Um, just what I, you said about recognizing our own role in, in anything. I have like questioned that or started to question that, like scratch the surface of questioning that about even what I would consider oppressions, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like that's where some of my discovery and my my path once wow. my exploration is, is like, ooh, the things that I've uh, clung to is, ooh, that's an oppression, that's a this, and and like, how much is it maybe a structural and a systemic oppression, and then how much is it me engaging mm. in that reflexive mechanism to default to some un unconscious pattern or right. conditioning so wow yeah. that is beautiful and it you know it's so important to clarify it doesn't mean there isn't oppression right right, right. and it but it's like what what are we you know there's um there's i think i mentioned we're in the part of where buddha runs into a lot of young distressed men in the forest that's this epoch of the book here and um he runs into this young man yasa and uh he says, he was like a person locked in a room without windows. He longed for fresh air, for a simple, wholesome life. Um, and this idea that we kind of, we can become trapped in our own minds and our own ideas. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's interesting. Also, when we start to kind of get a little bit of a sense that there's a lot of things that are unjust and wrong and bad and hard out there but what we do with it in here is actually a big part of our exhaustion so i've i've gotten um to work on burnout as a researcher for a number of years and nobody wants to hear this idea that possibly like burnout has some internal conditions and i get it i'm not i would definitely not write a paper about that or research it um but like we look at it like there's causes and conditions with burnout and they include us they're not limited to us there's many it's not like it's your fault and i think that's the unfortunate binary we get and really often in the healthcare system people are meant to feel as though their burnout is their fault so i'm not saying i'm not doing that version 
But I do think it's so like helpful for us to know like what is getting stirred by the cause and condition creating burnout. Is it striving? Is it despair? Is it over identification, right? There's so many factors and just saying like, this place is fucked and I'm burnt out. Like that feels good. <laughs> It feels so good, but it's not true, actually, right? There, and that it's so interesting. Um, you know, when Buddha started about dependent um, origination, he was like, "It's so simple, but it is so hard because people do not want to see it." It's just not what we want to examine or be with is kind of our role. Um, and, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say on this. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, there's so, I mean, there's so much beautifully written about uh, dependent or origination or co-arising. Um, but I think it often gets tied to, you know, samsara and that there's such a, a close link to not being able to see dependent origination and thereby falling into samsara. So if we think that that person out there is a problem, we're going to like separate, like you said, I'm going to, I'm going to take space. I'm going to get away from them. They're the problem. So we're like uh, starting to avoid things or like the other part of it. Like there was a moment today when I was feeling a little tired and I was like, Oh, like I want literally anything to make me feel better right now. I was like, fill in the blank. I was like, coffee, pizza, chocolate, call my partner. Like, what am I going to do? Like something out there, I need something out there. That's going to make me feel good, right? It's such an understandable default. Um, and, you know, instead of pulling apart, like, what am I actually feeling right now? And what are all the factors? What do I actually need? Um, yeah, it's a really, it's an interesting process that he invites us into. It's different than cause and effect, like, one thing happens and there's a result. It's really this like co-arising um, together. So that's my little, not so little preamble. And I hope you're like fired up now to do some <laughs> practice on it. Cause you know, the, like essentially like the whole chapter is like meditate on this, though it gives no meditations on it, you know, meditate on it. And I think for us to, um, kind of get to the truth of the matter. Um, sometimes dependent origination is called, you know, it's, it's very similar. It's like understanding it is understanding the Dharma and understanding the Dharma is understanding truth. And so in this practice, we try to understand the truth of our experience and like do so experientially, not just in this con conceptual way. So that's our motivation. So I invite us to find a posture that will, support our practice. <laughs> yes, get a cushion, get a dog if you're lucky. For friends at home, there's a nice dog curled up over there. Only one, we don't get to share, but um, rejoicing in that. <laughs> So yeah, let's let's give ourselves a moment for practice of really finding a posture that works for us. So I like folks who are experimenting with the floor and you know, if if we are sitting in a chair, really like feeling the ground beneath you. Mm, getting a sense, we'd like to have our knees a little bit lower than our hips if possible. And we'd like to have this sense kind of of a, a softening through the belly. If, you know, you're wearing skinny high-waisted jeans, maybe that's a little unbuttoning and could help out to have that free sense in the belly. 
and finding a place where the hands can rest on the lap that's comfortable. And giving ourselves a moment to really find spaciousness in the chest. We can do so by rising our shoulders up to our ears and then exhaling them down back and trying that twice more. Filling up and exhaling back once more. And finding a softening through the muscles in the face. As though you could soften and melt through the forehead and the brow and soften through the eyes. And soften through the cheekbones and the jaw. And just as we're inviting this softening, we're also inviting the vitality, the vividness and the wakefulness. We can feel that through the nice, long, upright spine. We can find this through our inhales. giving ourselves a couple breaths that are along to help settle into the body. So in whatever way feels comfortable and slowing the inhale. Like slowing the exhale. As we inhale, inviting the tummy to press out just a little bit, really filling our belly with air. And as we exhale, imagining the belly coming back towards the spine a bit. Let's have one long breath together. So, at the end of your exhale, keep exhaling. And then together, draw in a slow breath. And together, exhaling slowly, slowly. And coming to our natural rhythm, neither too long nor too short. I'm taking a couple moments here and just feeling the stillness of breath in the body. Maybe you notice that at the apertures of the nostril or at the belly, maybe the gentle rise of the chest. So allow the attention to be subtle, noticing the natural rhythm of breath.
And take a moment and notice where are you experiencing this subtlety of the breath? Not just the area at the nostrils or the belly or the chest, but are you noticing the breathing from within the body? Our awareness is throughout the entire body. There is no control center in the head. It's a full body experience. Really sense and notice the subtlety of the breath with the whole body. It's okay if the mind wanders, not a problem. It's okay if there's dullness. The mind is wandering, just gently come back and focus in the body and with the body. There's a feeling of dullness or fatigue. You could try to apply a bit more attention and vividness to the inhale. As we come back to following the breath time and time again, we get a sense of where our mind is at today or where our thoughts might be guiding us. I'm taking a moment here to reflect on our current state of mind and generate an intention that feels meaningful for where we are right now. This intention is like a guiding light, a way that we are orienting our practice, strengthening and cultivating. And shifting from the intention, letting it recede in the background. And bringing awareness, not only to the breath, but to all the tactile sensations in the body. And as we shift into this practice of fullness of feelings, we're going to notice this incredible and brief moment of contact, right when a sensation arises, noticing how we label it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. 
There may be some underlying aches or tingling or heaviness. We can investigate those. And we may also notice the sensations just that just arise, like an itch, like other energy. As much as possible, really noticing the sensation as sensation, getting so curious about the quality of the sensation, and then noticing <clears throat> how we apply this label to it. our mind categorizing it as something we like or don't like, or just something that doesn't matter to us at all. And we could start by kind of clenching our fists together for a moment and then releasing and noticing that sensation. So our primary practice is noticing tactile sensations in the body and recognizing right as we label them, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And if no sensation seems pronounced, <clears throat> then simply being mindful of the body and its gentle shifts and changes. Again, no problem if you get distracted and carried away. Just relax and release and refresh your interest. Continuing to notice sensations throughout the body and how we perceive them. Maybe there's a desire to shift the posture. Notice the feeling right before the desire.
maybe an itch arises. Noticing the sensation, noticing the aversion, allowing yourself to scratch the itch and noticing how that Maybe we get to notice that an unpleasant sensation arises somewhere. And we notice that it doesn't stay. It shifts and changes, dissipates. Noticing also neutral. moments between a sensation that feels good or bad. And then considering if we can continue this mindfulness, the sensations in the body without any attribution of pleasant or unpleasant, neutral. In the sensation, letting it just be sensation, no preference.
beyond these shifts and changes of sensations in the body. We might feel something kind of like a loving presence, something not conditioned by itches or tightness. without necessarily looking for it, just being open to the experience of really inhabiting and being in the body, bringing our mindfulness to the body. And a sense or quality of more subtle presence. Our basic loving presence. That's always already here. Refreshing our interests once again and being with sensations in the body as much as possible, just letting them be as they are and resting in a presence with them. Thank you for your practice. Wow, it's really, I felt such a good stillness in this room, even with some extra auditory help from the outside. Just felt like there was a lot of stillness here. Thank you so much. Any questions, reflections? We had that, you know, extra long preamble on why we're going to do that practice. It's okay if that didn't translate in, but this kind of direct experiencing or this opportunity <clears throat> to directly experience how our sensations and our attributions come. Anyone notice anything they'd like to share on that?
please. Yes. I like your shirt. <clears throat> Hey friends. <laughs> like this is like the it's like the Las Vegas, you know, you can take it all over the big stage. <laughs> that was lovely. Thank you. I kind of wanted to pick up the mic first so that I can I don't have my experience colored by what happens next. Um, so um, noticing the, the different sensations, um, you know, I've come to this place before and I've, I've shared about it before, but it was a pretty deep experience of, um, um, of having a lot of um, uh, different sensations that might be a vibration, something like a deep itch, mm -hmm. um, something like a pulsating feeling that might be <clears throat> relaxing or it could be quickening and, 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 and seem to be, you know, exciting and energizing. And um, whether these these sensations are seen as pleasant, you know, that I want to grasp for them, or or it just it really depends where I am in perspective, what what my perspective is to them. If I'm trying to relax and I'm getting excited, it seems bad, <laughs> right? You know, if I'm trying to, if I, if I if I'm falling asleep and, and I don't want to, and I, and, and that happens, it seems good. Yeah. And then I have this weird thought that, you know, this is this place to decide what's good and bad and those things. That's, that seems to be where I think I exist. Right. Beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Friends online, any thoughts, reflections? Do we go too deep into loving presence? Did people notice loving presence? Was that there? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, it seems like it's really far away, but it's actually like, it's kind of actually there. Um, and that, you know, I loved how you said it. Like, I am not that which is deciding, which is good and bad. <laughs> so much of our energy is caught up in that like good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know what you all, when I do this practice, I also notice that discomfort in my body, like depending on, um, how I'm relating to it makes my mental chatter stronger too. Right. Really pulls me away more. So, yeah. Yes. Can you, do you mind saying more about loving presence, uh, loving presence? Yeah, I could say more about loving presence forever. Buddha nature, right? So this idea that, um, you know, which I love is that we're, we're already good, uh, which is such a radical idea, such a beautiful idea. And again, <clears throat> and similar to, uh, dependent origination is a concept, right? That we're all good. And then a direct experience of it. And then we can directly experience that um, as my, one of my root teachers, Alan Wallace would say that the wellspring 
inside of us of happiness is like always there. Like it's flowing like that deepest wellspring of our, of our happiness. And it's just a matter of, you know, removing the dust from the gold or getting out of the way. And I do like how Chogyam Trumpa describes it as um, basic goodness. And then Sokni as basic okayness. So they're kind of hedging Buddha nature. You're already perfect. You're good. You're okay. <laughs> like wherever you can get on board, you know, and I do think as a felt experience, um, I'd be curious your, your experience of it, like as a felt experience, it's subtle. And so we miss it. It's easy to miss, you know, easy to miss. And I think it's, you know, that I, I was describing earlier in the day, how, when I was feeling kind of, I don't even know really what I was feeling, maybe stressed, um, and I, w I just wanted something from the outside to make me feel better. I was like, I don't know what it is, but something's going to, I need something out there. So it's so um, difficult for us to find that within. Um, and yet, unless we're in acute distress, which happens, we can find it. We can have access to it. And sometimes we do use things from the outside, but things from the outside are actually also potentially able to show us what's good inside. Like I think a lot about this beautiful meditation um, where you, you know, you kind of take a little image of um, the Buddha and you just gaze upon his face and you consider the qualities of the Buddha and you imagine them inside of yourself, right? That idea of like that transfer inside. Um, and eventually then you don't need the statue to gaze on. You just find it in yourself. Yeah. Any other questions or um, reflections on that practice? Yes, please. Uh, my mind was just jumping up and down. I was lost in thought, follow the thoughts, and then I hear your voice. I come back, and then sometimes I'll just go back to the breath and follow it and Great. so forth. And um, somewhere around the, the practice, I opened up my eyes mm. and I seen everybody meditating. And I realized that there's a world outside of me. Mm. And it's like, so it's kind of like, <laughs> I guess I'm just so self-centered that it's all about me. Kind of like, I don't know, it was just weird. Yeah. So it's just something that um, it's just like, oh, there's other people here. It's not mm. just me. Yeah. How did that affect your practice or did it? Um, it just made me more at that moment, more aware that there's, um, I'm not the center of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. So. And did that help you relax at all? Did the mind settle a bit? A little bit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how about, you know, super normal jumpy mind. I'm sure a lot of people experience that. Yeah. How, like, did it feel to you like, oh, this is not a good practice? Or were you able to be like, this is just um, what's here? Or There's yeah. a thought that comes in that says, this is not a good practice. But uh, the many books that I have read says it's part of the practice. Yeah, good. So it's like my, my feeling is this is not a good practice. But then I'm reminded of this is a good practice. Yeah. And I love that wisdom that you had to open your eyes. Like, was it like a thought I should open my eyes or just opening? Uh, I think I was just being bombarded by the thoughts. Yeah. I had to open my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I think that seeing, you know, and as is said so much in this part of the book, like being with Sangha, right. It does help us. You know, we all do forget like center of the world, definitely seems like us um it's very hard to to break that out um yeah thank you so much for sharing that thank you. anybody else have like a lot of thoughts like thought gymnastics a lot of things going around yeah yeah there's a lot a lot of material and i'd like to believe you know um that especially at the end of a day when we're practicing if we can Sometimes we're going to get dragged around by them, but sometimes we're going to let them kind of bounce their way out. And like, I hope they are liberating themselves in that way. You know, like we're just kind of giving them space to come and then go and come and then go and <clears throat> not necessarily needing to work with them any further. Oh, so, yeah. 
So <clears throat> let's get into let's let's catch up with Lord Buddha here in the forest with all these incredibly um you know fortunate young man who run into his path right as for he's awakening. So I was talking about Yasa here. So I'll say this first line again. He was like a person locked in a room without windows. He longed for some fresh air, for a simple, wholesome life. The night before, Yasa and some friends had gathered to feast, drink, and play music, be entertained by lovely young women. In the middle of the night, he woke up and looked at his friends, and the young women sprawled out asleep. At that moment, he knew he could not continue to live that way. He threw a cloak over his body, slipped on a pair of sandals, and walked out the front gate, not even knowing where he would go. He wandered aimlessly all night until by chance he found himself um, facing uh, in Deer Park and then facing the Buddha. Because when the Buddha ran into him, he, he was saying, uh, the man approached close to him saying, disgusting, repulsive. Um, and the Buddha said, there's nothing disgusting and there's nothing repulsive. And he described his experience. And the Buddha said to him, life is filled with suffering, but it's also filled with many wonders. To drown in sensual pleasures is bad for the health of the body and the mind. But if you live simply and wholesomely and not ruled by desires, it's possible to experience the many wonders of life. Look around you. Can you see the trees standing in the morning mists? Are they not beautiful? The moon, the stars, the rivers, the mountains, the sunlight, the song of the birds, the sounds of the bubbling springs, all manifestations of a universe which can provide endless happiness. So I love that he isn't saying, you know, give up on these, you know, parties with your friends and these young women, you know, enjoying yourself is reckless and unwholesome. He's saying, there's so many other beautiful ways to enjoy this world. Like look around you and don't attribute suffering um, just to our sensory and sensual world. Like there's so much goodness in our sensory and sensual world. Um, he says, uh, the happiness we receive from these things nourishes mind and body. Close your eyes and breathe in and out a few times. What do you see? Trees, sky, rays of sunlight. Your own two eyes are wonders. Because you've been out of touch with wonders like these, you have come to eyes, your mind and body. Some people despise their mind and body so much, they want to commit suicide. They see only suffering in life. But suffering is not the true nature of the universe. Suffering is the result of the way we lived and not understanding the nature of life. The Buddha's words touch, touched Yasa like fresh drops of cool dew to soothe his parched heart. Overcome with happiness, he prostrated for the Buddha and asked to become a disciple. So just this, you know, chance encounter. And again, I, there's all these like little teeny teachings built in, but this idea of kind of losing our sense of wonder for the world right? Not even be able to see the wonder through our eyes because we're just like overloaded by excess. And that might be more true than ever. And I think it's an interesting part of our meditation practice. I remember very early into my own meditation practice, a teacher, you know, your practice is increasing when you start to notice the flowers more. And I was like, huh, and then I think at some point I was like, oh, yeah, I notice flowers more. Like it actually came to fruition. Um, and that ability to like see into the beauty, the natural beauty of the world. And we're so fortunate to live here. Um, driving today, I saw, you know, the mist coming over the mountains and it's like stunning. It's just unbelievable. And so easy to miss. And so easy to just kind of be like, I can't, I'm like, there's too much happening out there. I just can't. Um, and so how do we develop this, this kind of aspect of freshness and wonder, especially in the natural world? The really beautiful part of this teaching that he's giving Yasa, which is, you know, how to live a wholesome life and a simple life, but how to really, you know, kind of take wonder um, through sensory pleasure of the world.
He says, a monk lives a simple and humble life. He has no money. He sleeps in a grass hut or beneath the trees. He eats only what he receives and one meal a day. Can you live like this? He says, I would be living life. A monk develops his mind and body to realize liberation in order to help himself and all others. He concentrates his efforts to relieve suffering. Do you vow to such a path? Yes, he does. And I accept you as my disciple. In my community, it is known as a bhikkhu or a beggar. Every day you will go to beg your food in order to nourish yourself and to practice humility, to be in touch with others in order to show and to be in touch with others to, to show them the way. And it's interesting, you know, this practice of begging that was so traditional um, and in the early kind of teachings of the Buddha, you see that some of the first things that happens, your head gets shaved, you get a robe and you start begging. And it's not just, you know, so then if you're begging, you don't have to work, so you have more time to meditate. That, that matters. That's helpful. But it's also this practice of humility. Really, everything that is offered to you, you receive. And you receive it with that sense of um, appreciation and to rely on others so deeply. For many of us, we might believe that we actually don't rely on others. Does anybody believe that here? I do sometimes, right? Like, you know, it's it's like, oh, it's nice to have friends, but like, I, I don't rely on anyone. Like, I'm self-sufficient. So it's really interesting how this practice of begging for your food, it really, it forges that humility. I might have mentioned this before, but just recently, the John Templeton Foundation is a foundation that has you know, funded quite a lot of research in, in, in spiritual areas. They funded a lot in awe and in gratitude. And recently they've been funding in humility. I'm like, wow, it's about time. It's like the least prized uh, aspect of our personality and contemporary culture, right? This, this humility. <clears throat> and I think it's, um, it's a, it's a interesting one to cultivate, right? Like how do we actually practice humility? Part of it is recognizing we are dependent on everyone, right? That none of the things that we have achieved or done are on our own. Friends come <laughs> and three quarters of them are like ordained on the spot and then more just keep coming and they just keep coming. And so this is, you know, the first time that the Buddha is really starting to have a Sangha. Um, and he has this Sangha many times over, but this is his first Sangha. And it's also the first time that there are lay disciples. So the first lay disciple is Yasa's father who comes looking for him in the forest, so worried, like, what happened to my son, right? He ran off after this party. Nobody knows where he is. Um, and he just said, you know, what's become of my son? And uh, the Buddha said, you know, Yasa, he says, uh, da, 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 da. Yasa is a bright and sensitive young man. He's found the path of liberation for his heart. He has faith, peace, and joy. Please be happy for him. Um, and he said that tells his father just his little teaching on how it's possible to live in a way to reduce suffering and anxiety and create peace and joy for oneself and everyone around him. And he have these beautiful descriptions. Like he says, the merchant felt lighter with each word the Buddha spoke. He asked to be accepted as a lay disciple. And then his mother, uh, just a night later, as she listened to the Buddha, she felt as though a gate of happiness had opened in her heart. Just such these beautiful descriptions of when we encounter the teachings and they really move us. And we know like there is something there for me. Mm. Steve, yeah. What's a lay disciple? That's such a good question. Is it like us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there could be a monk in the room <laughs> undercover. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the lay disciple, you know, so the precepts for the lay disciple, right? The, probably most of you are familiar with who have heard for the, um, it's so interesting. And we'll, we'll track this at first for the, um, for the monks, there's something like 12 precepts. 
about six chapters in, there's like 122. It's like, they just keep growing. Like monks keep kind of messing up. They're like, oh yeah. And you're not allowed to go back home and be with your wife and then come back. And, you know, like all the um, things that they discover as more and more people become monks, but the lay precepts are not killing because all living beings fear death. And if we truly understand a path of understanding and love, we'll observe this precept. Not only should we protect the lives of humans, we should protect the lives of animals as well. Observing this precept nourishes compassion and wisdom. And the second precept is to not steal. We do not have the right to steal property of others, nor gain wealth by taking advantage of the labor of others. We must find ways to help others support themselves. This one at face value seems simple to not steal. But when you hear it this way, that not to gain wealth by taking advantage of the labor of others. That's like all of us, right? Um, in terms of, well, I won't say all of us, but many of us who wear clothing or have items or things that are built on labor that is, is fundamentally exploitative. So it, it is, it's interesting to, to, to see what this is inviting for you, like a real consciousness around all the decisions you're making, right? To not steal, not just literally not take what someone else has, but really think about um, the nature of what we have. And then the third precept is not to engage in sexual misconduct. Um, don't vi violate the rights and commitments of others. And this, and I think this is antiquated, but it says always remain faithful to your spouse, because I think that goes in contrast to don't violate the rights and commitments of others, because now, of course, um, especially in the Bay Area, but other parts of the world, polyamory is a way in which you are not violating rights and commitments and honoring your partner or spouse. Um, but I think this idea of sexual misconduct has to do with really, again, like how do we bring mindfulness into every part of our life, right? Our sexuality and our relationships, it should be right in the center, right? It's not as though we practice meditation and then, but you know, in our relationship, it's totally different, right? None of those things apply. Uh, the teacher who I am fortunate to sit with often says that relationship is like truly the spiritual path. She calls it the spiritual crucible, right? It's the charnel ground. It's where we actually see all of our raw, unmetabolized material. It's just a relief because, you know, anyone who's been in a relationship knows that that happens, right? And in fact, it's such an amazing opportunity for us to see, especially like we started talking about the very beginning of today, what's our conditioning and our habits? What's our perception we're projecting onto others? Nothing like a good relationship to show us all of that. Um, the fourth precept is to not say untruthful things. So hard. Do not utter words that distort the truth or cause discard and hatred. Do not spread news that you don't know to be certain. So I've, I have proclaimed here that there is scientific benefits of gossip, and I stand by that because sharing information is important. And especially, you know, when we're in workplaces and larger organizations, it's not as though like you get some clear understanding of what's happening without talking to other people. But this idea of like, when are we causing harm or discord by our speech? It's, I think it's the hardest one really like how like it's it's just so enjoyable to talk with other people about other people right it's just it's juicy yes and also it goes possibly against the never say untruths right because in a lot of cases you actually say the truth that is actually harmful that's right Oh, yeah. Yep. Right. Um, so for folks online, like it's not just about saying the truth. It's about saying what is kind, right? The four gates. Yeah. That is a really good question. <laughs> when you talk to a therapist about other people, are you breaking a precept? I would say no. I'd say, you know, like that is an environment in which, because a lot of it, like everything comes down to intention, right? And in a therapeutic relationship, the intention is healing. And 
it, and sometimes in our healing, we have to really like share, but also be open to, um, hearing what is shared back to us. Yeah. No, good question. And the last um, precept is to not use alcohol or other stimulants. And it's interesting. I've seen some uh, pretty awesome spiritual teachers trying to understand how this relates to or doesn't relate to, especially this new kind of renaissance with psychedelics, which many people are using for spiritual awakening. And yet, which definitely, it doesn't say it here, but often says like distorts or um, occludes, right, our um, our consciousness, I would say, again, it comes to intention, right? Are you using this to escape, to distort, to disappear? Um, are you using this in order to kind of heighten or more deeply understand your spiritual path and journey? Um, and I've seen spiritual teachers on both sides say, Generally, what I often hear is, ah, oh, it's a shortcut. You should just meditate, which I totally appreciate that. And yet for some of us, you know, we need a, we need a bigger hammer. Um, and I also have heard teachers say, like, again, if you're using it with the intention of your spiritual path and integrating it with practice, um, it doesn't necessarily fall into this kind of um, substance use or abuse. And, you know, arguably you could say the same with alcohol. Can people, you know, enjoy alcohol and not have a relationship with it in which they are really being pulled away from their dharma, right? It's just, it's so tricky with things like alcohol and, and other stimulants that they can definitely um, temporarily alleviate our suffering, but actually perpetuate the roots of our suffering. And that's, that's the tricky part that we all have to work with and figure out for ourselves. Did you say cookies? Yeah, cookies too. It's true. We can have an unwholesome relationship. Yeah, right? Caffeine is a stimulant. Yeah. I know. And I think, yeah, I think it's really interesting. So when folks hear these precepts, right, these are not required to enter the door here, by the way. Um, but when you hear these precepts, is there like, yes, like, I want that? Or is it like, uh, maybe one or two? <laughs> Just curious, like, what is what's your relationship? Because these are these are the lay precepts. They, they have not been updated. They are the same ones. Arguably, we could update them. That might be interesting. Oh. Yeah. One of the things that I've always heard about the last preset is to refrain from the use of intoxicants and other behavior, heedlessness. Mm. And there's that, that caveat at the end of leading to heedlessness. And it does have to do with intention and intention can be one can be a part of it, but even with the best of intentions, <laughs> if true. one finds that it's leading to heedlessness, then I would think about what I was doing. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And, for, and, and for me, it's, it's, it's easy for me to refrain at this point in my life, it's easy for me to refrain yeah. from the use of intoxicants and other behavior that lead to heedlessness. Yeah, other behavior that lead to heedlessness. That's, I mean, yeah, you know, I've I've heard teachers talk about that in the in the sense of the media and how we how we spend our time um, online, how, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there's, it's, it's a lot of stuff to it. Yeah. It's, not, it's, in, it's layered and it's getting more and more complicated. Like you said earlier, this may be so far the, the most complicated time in history for us to be drawn away from, from, from our, 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 our sense our our Buddha nature yeah. and our sense of of okayness because there's so much telling us that 
we're not okay, or we need more stimulus, or we need, you know, we need more screen time, or we need less screen time, we're on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And and I do find Thich Nhat Hanh's reading um, in general of a lot of these um, aspects of kind of core Buddhist teaching conservative, right? You know, like he doesn't say heedless. He's just like, no alcohol and stimulants <laughs> and we're done. Right. And um, it's interesting because I think of heedlessness, I, I definitely associate with certain substances, but then dullness, like what about leading us to dullness? right? And numbing and kind of dissociation. Um, and again, like why? Um, it, it doesn't, it's not unpacked here, but like why these precepts, you know, what are they serving for us? And I, I've said this before, but I, I really love the sense that we get when we get closer to our practice of just a natural renunciation, where we start to just feel drawn to let things go that don't support our practice instead of like, oh, I shouldn't do that. Like, oh, that's not good. Like, that's wrong. And, you know, I think, you know, it really, it starts to become clearer as we start to become more sensitive. You know, I don't know about, about you all, but in addition to seeing more beautiful flowers, which I'm grateful for, I can like almost watch nothing that's on contemporary television like my nervous system is just like blown out by the amount of anxiety that most characters in like shows have like and it's supposed to be funny and I'm like ah, they're, not funny. Like, they're making a huge mistake you know like I'm so empathically engaged and I'm like god tv sucks now and I think I just like I can't be with it right we've we're forging and opening certain channels. And so it becomes more natural for me to be like, Blue Planet sounds good again. <laughs> like, or I don't know. I'm not trying to plug, but like Ted Lasso, if you guys haven't watched that. <laughs> He's like the nicest character that's ever been on television. There's been a lot written about this. I'm like, finally, there's like a show I can watch. Um, but there's other characters who are mean and they keep me up at night. And <laughs> So, you know, I think it's like, it is like really starting to tune into like what gets in the way, right? And not like our whole life should be dedicated so that we have a good meditation. Like, no, but our whole life should feel aligned, like internally coherent, right? Like what is drawing us here? What were our intentions for showing up here tonight? Right. And that's why I love using intention setting sometimes that just meets you where you are tonight. Right. So tonight, like when I sat here, I was like, oh, I just, I just am happy to be in community of like minded people like that. That's what I need right now, you know, just feel less isolated. And um, yeah, I just think it's a really a sweet way for us to pay attention to what matters. And I'm not saying this, you know, ditch the precepts. I think there's some wisdom in them. But I think like leaning into that, that sense of what, is supporting your practice and what's in the way of your practice um, makes sense. Yeah. It's just, it's just, okay. That was part of the discussion. I really appreciate the multi dimensionality of it. I was just, as you were saying that, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was, um, I've been involved in communities where it feels like the intention to obey the precepts is a, can be a problem as well mm. because, um, you know, it's kind of like, um, people getting very filled with their own sense of righteousness. Like, I don't do this. I don't do that. I know that yeah. you know, sense of like, um, you know, you poor sucker. I'm, I'm so far ahead of you right. because you just, you know, you just had a, a beer or something. Right. And so it just sort of feels like that there's intention can work in that direction Absolutely. as well. I'm thus, yeah, I just, I'm confused about it, but I've, I've been around enough to know that sometimes it feels like that. Yeah the guy who's going out and getting a beer is like having a better path. <laughs> so then the person is saying, I would never do, you know, who's being sort of self-righteous and yeah. um, puffed up about it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just. No, like thank you for think. sharing that. Yeah. And, and I do think it kind of can be different for different people. Right. Um, and what your needs are. So is there a, a hand or a comment online? Okay. 
Sorry, is it me? Sorry, is it me? Yeah. Oh, no. I'm getting an echo. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I really, I, I wanted to comment about the sensitization and as it relates to the, uh, I don't know which precept it is, but the one about speaking truth. And I, um, uh, part of my coming to practice was about having a sense of a of a of a sort of a global way in which I was not being honest in the world with myself almost more than with anyone else, but with other people as well. And so that's been like a huge part of my practice is developing uh, developing the figuring out like why that was happening and what it meant and and how to stop doing it. And uh, and I've become more and more sensitive to it to the mm -hmm. point where like it used to be that I would think, oh, you know, that thing I said the other day, <laughs> that, that that wasn't right. Or, mm -hmm. you know, and often it's like um, it's like a um, what, what is it? It's like a maintenance of, you know, my image of who I am for myself mm. and others that leads to this, you know, uh, non, -truth, non, non truthfulness. But now it's gotten to the point where it, like it happens in real time. Like I'll be like, oh, I'm about to say something untruthful and I can sometimes like notice it and be like, yeah. why do I want to say that? Like I'm talking about very subtle things like exaggerating yeah even, yep. you know so it's almost like this thing that i used to not even notice or notice later and now like i can't even do it like i can't right you know not all the time don't get me wrong you know but yeah. it's so interesting it's kind of like the, the seeing the flowers thing yeah i know and again seeing the flowers we're gonna focus on that one the other ones like make us seem less fun right as practitioners yeah. um and and it's true. It, it, it's not, not that it's true that we're less fun, but it's true that the sensitivity gets heightened. Um, but liberation, you know, God, like if there was any, I've said this a lot. There's any other way to be happy and free, I would try it. I wouldn't. But I think that there's not like an easy path. The sensitization and and gaining that kind of insight in the moment, like you're saying, no, of why am I saying this? This is untrue, and not only is untrue, but like this will probably not benefit myself and others, right? So, yeah. but there's also a great sense of relief with that. Sense yeah, of, you know, even that if it's huge. sometimes a little weird. That's it. That's like again to just to quote, you know, one of my root teachers, Alan. He says, "You want to lay down your head on the pillow of night at night with the bliss of blamelessness, like knowing that you lived your day in accordance with your own values and virtues." You know, like that's a nice way to lay your head down, and it's also good. He said it's a great way to sit down to practice, like. If you go out and just do all this stuff in the world that's thoughtless and possibly potentially harmful, and then you try to sit and practice, like, good luck. So, yeah. Jim, did you have a comment? Oh, I was just going to comment that of the precepts, it's, for me, it's just trying not to take it black and white. Yeah. I think not very often a lot of these commandments or precepts are like, <laughs> you know, it's not yeah. black and white in the world is very rarely yeah yeah um for folks at home just saying that these precepts are not black and white and it can seem like commandments sort of take them that way um and how to make them yeah also like come alive like why is this one there I'm like what does that mean for me um yeah can't believe we're already almost at time um so tonight we have a little bit of a uh, a special opportunity a sangha to support one another so we actually have two sangha members actually a sangha member and a teacher who have um, surgeries coming up and i'm hoping we can dedicate our practice tonight to their health and well-being one is our beloved walt it's gonna be on next monday walt is that right Okay, so we'll be sending this now, but also thinking of you Monday. Yeah, and um, and Chandra, my beloved co-teacher, is having a back surgery on Friday, and I told her that we would be holding her as well. 
So we can really beautifully dedicate the merit of our time tonight to these, of course, all beings are deserving of our love and compassion, but so nice to have a focus on being so beloved to us. So first, just returning and coming into the body. Taking a moment to notice the sensations in the body that maybe have shifted since when we first arrived. And considering internally our sense of compassion and kindness that we carry with us throughout this life and that has huge potential. We could sense this compassion as a warmth or a light at our heart center. Another part of our intrinsic birthright, this ability to care and love for one another. I'm really feeling a sense of that as light at our heart. And first, bringing to mind our beloved Sangha member, Walt. And with our next exhales, just sending some of our compassion and kindness towards him to help strengthen his body and prepare him. Considering on our out breath, may you be healthy and strong. May you know peace and ease. May you feel love and belonging. And returning to that sense of light at the heart. I'm just feeling if anything has been stirred or strengthened as we extend our compassion and love. Somewhat paradoxically, it can grow. Mm become even brighter. And bringing to mind our beloved teacher and friend, Chandra. And with her in our mind's eye, really radiating and sending light and love to her as she prepares for this surgery on Friday. And again, with the out breath, is sending her this blessing of strength. May you be healthy and strong. May you know peace and ease. May you feel love and belonging. And returning to this radiant light at our hearts and just bursting all the doors open and considering the possibility that we could send this aspiration out to all beings. May all beings be healthy and strong. May all beings know peace and ease. May all beings no love and belonging. Oh, I felt our healing powers. Beautiful work. Um, just a reminder that we exist here in the Dharma Collective out of generosity. Could really use your support and help. Um, rent is San Francisco. Need I say more? 
Um, and yeah, your monthly donations especially really help us know and be able to um, keep the lights on, the internet going. And our friends at home, your donations also really help, um, especially with the internet tonight. We're tethered to a phone, which is amazing technology, but generally we need internet. So yeah, everything is so appreciated. We have some wonderful stuff coming up. Um, I know for sure also... Tig will be here for me. I'll be on retreat next week. Yeah. Um, probably be really miserable at first and then get good as retreats go. But I'll be on retreat next week and Tig will be here. And we have so much. Oh, we have a sound bag. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, friends. Yeah. So check out Saturday. If you come here at, if you feel that you're a member of the queer community from 5.30 to 7, you can come to the Q Sangha and totally soak up some Tig love mm -hmm. and Sangha love. And then you can go get a burrito <laughs> and then you can come, or whatever it is, and then you can come back. Do we still have space? for the sound bath at 8.15, and you can make sure that you haven't digested so much of your burrito that you're gonna be a problem for your neighbors. <laughs> but like fully enjoy the sound and just like such an excellent night coming up at the Dharma Collective. And then you can go home and digest and go to bed and sleep. And then you can come back on Sunday at 11 for the Dharma and intimacy and seriously process your stuff. So I think that we are rolling in the good stuff and y'all should hang out with us this weekend and then check the calendar for all the regular stuff otherwise thank you <laughs>